Good morning and happy Sunday. I invite everyone to please stand with us as we read from Galatians 2, verse 20. And it says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a wonderful reminder it is to, as as children of God, that we no longer live according to God's uh, that we no longer live according to the world standard, but instead think about God's kingdom. Our pursuit of being holy, just, and transformation starts with a mindset uh, of allowing Jesus to reveal where our hearts are. So the more we pray and tune to his word, you'll find that he convicts us to turn away from sin, and that is to repent and share in the eternal promises only the word of God can give. So as we worship and sing songs of praise this morning, let us declare God's grace and faithfulness in our lives. To God be the glory. Let's worship together.
Good morning, and once again, welcome to the visitors and to all members. I want you to turn around, turn to your neighbor, and just greet them with a warm welcome this morning. Welcome, SBC.
Father, we thank you for allowing us and giving us this another opportunity to gather as a church family to worship you and lift your name on high, O oh God. Lord, thank you because you have been faithful to us and you have set us free from the dominion of sin and we became slaves to righteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have justified us and you continue to sanctify us, O oh God. Lord, as we continue to follow you in our lives, O oh God. May your Holy Spirit continue to minister to us and lead us, O oh God, as we continue to obey you. We pray, Lord, for our worship today. May we be become receptive to your word. May we become doers of your word, O oh God, and may your Holy Spirit lead us, Lord God, in the way everlasting. We glorify you and magnify you, O oh God. We adore you. We pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. Let's give the Lord another round of applause. Amen. His name is power, amen? amen? And His name is healing. Well, praise God. So happy to be home after three weeks once again. Thank you for your prayers. We had a very fruitful and successful meetings and conferences in New York, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. Praise God. We were able to meet the pastors in the metro a New York area, 15 of them, planting churches, Filipino-Americans. And then in Springfield and uh, Jersey City and also the Washington, D.C. area. Praise God. But please pray for me and Jenny as we uh, fly again tomorrow at 2.40. We're going to Doha, Qatar, to uh, ordain and install five Filipino pastors in that Muslim area. Amen? <laughs> And there's going to be a big meeting of 100 churches. We're expecting 2,000 people in Doha, Qatar. It will be a big time, a, a big celebration of uh, Filipino believers. But uh, the ministry there is in small groups. So in houses, in offices, in schools, there are small groups. And Filipinos are reaching even to the Muslims. The Lord is at work. Amen? Amen in many places around the world. So praise God uh, for those opportunities to serve God in different uh, areas. The Word of God, as uh, we pray uh, in Philippians chapter 4, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Everybody say, always. always. Amen? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And then, the po Apostle Paul said, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In the midst of storms, in the midst of trials, we can have peace, amen? Because the Lord is with us. But the Lord leads us to victory also. How many of you are witnesses to the fact that our God answers prayers? Amen? Wow. God answers prayers. So if you are celebrating anniversaries, uh, birthdays, promotions, or answer to God's prayers. Let's lift all these praises to God and lift our petitions and requests to God also this morning. Let's bow our heads in the presence of the Lord. Lord God, yes, as we have sung, the name of Jesus is power. The name of Jesus is healing. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, as we worship you this morning, we lift to you our praises, 
our adoration, our thanksgiving. Thank you for answering our prayers, so oh God. To those who have labored fervently, asking God, and waited for two years or so many months, thank you, God, for answering our prayers. Thank you for our brothers and sisters celebrating occasions and events in their lives, birthdays, anniversaries, promotions. Lord, we say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because you are a faithful God. But thank you, Lord, also, because in the midst of storms, in the midst of trials and difficult times, in the midst of darkness, we can have peace, oh God, in our hearts and in our minds because we know you are with us. But thank you for the victory. Thank you because you have shown yourself powerful. You are a healing God. And you answer all our prayers. Thank you, Lord. We adore you. We magnify you. We praise you, O God. But Lord, we lift up to you our concerns. You know the concerns, the requests of everyone here. Maybe there's one here who's going through dark times, difficult times, trying times in economy, in business, in the work or health, or, or whatever concerns we may have. It could be relationships. It could be a physical illness we're going through. Lord, yes, we lift this. We lift all this in the name of our powerful God and our Heavenly Father. We remember to you our city. We remember to you. We remember to pray for our country, O oh God, as we go through Many transitions, even here as at SBMA, in our country, the new administration, the president, uh, the Congress, the Senate, and the Supreme Court, the LGUs, oh God, we lift our country to you. As we still feel the impact of the pandemic crisis all over the Philippines, the inflation, the rising prices of electricity, water, food, and all commodities. Oh God, have mercy. Have mercy, O oh Lord. And please give wisdom to our leaders on how to um, navigate through these uh, difficult times in our country. And not only here, but in many places around the world. But Lord, today we declare that our powerful God, the creator of the universe, the one who controls every planet, every stars in the sky, is the same God, is the same Heavenly Father that controls our lives. And you are with us even at this moment. I pray for every person, individual, family, including uh, businesses and all activities, oh God, including the students, oh God, as they go through summer vacation or go to transitions in school. Lord, we pray that you will protect our children. Be with them, oh God. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, protect them against the wiles of the enemy and the, the, the uh, culture that is destroying the lives of our children. Please protect the family, every person, and every individual. Thank you that corporately here at SBCF, we have a home. We have a spiritual home. We have a community. We have a family that we can belong to so that we can be fed spiritually, so that we can uh, 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 encourage one another to grow in the faith, to abide in the Lord. Use every worship service, every activity, event, and all the disciple-making sessions that are going on in our church to draw us closer to you. Lord, thank you. 
we worship you. We lift the name of Jesus this morning. Come as we open our hearts and our ears, oh God, uh, for the word of God. We pray for Pastor Perona as he speak the word of God, as he delivered the message of God for each one of us. Lord, I pray that every seed of the word that will be planted in our hearts will grow in our lives. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning for everyone. And so we all experience anxiety in our daily lives, right? But here let us remind ourselves of the assurance of God who gives us everything that we need. In this world where fear, worry, doubt, and anxiety just easily takes our hearts and minds, we just feel helpless and guilty of feeling this way. But thank God that he is so forgiving and always rejoices when we grow in faith and bounce back in his name. He rejoices when we seek him. It says in Matthew 6, 31 to 33, So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. So church, let us be reminded to not spend our time focusing on anxieties or getting the worldly luxuries in our daily lives, but instead humble ourselves so we can seek God and what he prioritizes over, which is to grow his kingdom. Doing so can provide us comfort, strength, and the knowledge that all our needs will be met in his name. Let us pray. Lord, you are so merciful and just. Thank you for always providing for everything that we need. We offer you our thanksgiving. We pray that you may use these treasures that are rightfully yours to grow your heavenly kingdom. We ask that you may strengthen us, strengthen our minds, and especially the flesh to seek you more. Amen. Good morning, church. Just like Bishop Noel, it's very good to be back after three very busy weeks traveling across uh, America. And just like Bishop Noel, I've been busy meeting many people. I have met Mickey Mouse, uh, Minnie Mouse, and Chewbacca, who I tried to minister to. But at the time, I don't know if he was, uh, couldn't understand me or if he was busy because it was still his shift. <laughs> but anyway, I'll go back and continue what I started next time. Uh, Brother Ian decided it would be a good idea to put me to work the first day coming back. So here I am, <laughs> standing in front of you, and I've been given once again the privilege of introducing our guest speaker for today. And uh, we asked, how would he like to be introduced today? And he said, bahala na kayo. So off the cuff, so I said, okay, let's, let's just wing it. <laughs> so our guest speaker for today is actually no stranger to SBCF. He's partnered with us over the years in various ministries and spoke here already many times at our church. But because of the pandemic, this would be his first time back at SBCF after three long years. Our guest speaker uh, he served before as a senior pastor in GCF Baguio, where our dear Pastor Mao served as an associate pastor under him, and they both helped grow God's kingdom there in Baguio. And they formed a beautiful mentorship relationship as well as a good friendship that blossomed. They have a passion together, uh, our guest speaker and his beautiful wife, uh, Tita Floyd. Tita Floyd, could you uh, uh, raise your hand? Let's uh, welcome her as well. They have a passion for ministering to. Um, married couples, uh, they specialize as well in 
marriage counseling and bringing families together to follow the Lord. Uh, he is currently serving as uh, an elder at GCF Ortigas and is a self-proclaimed retired pastor at large continuing to serve the Lord. <laughs> Without further ado, let's welcome our dear brother in the Lord, Pastor Arnold Ferrana. So that is what it means when you say you, you will wing it. Huh? <laughs> I also take pride in letting you know that uh, our brother Bolt and uh, Sids are my inaanats. Uh, our brother Ian and uh, his beautiful wife Mara are also my inaanat right here. Also Chris and uh, MM. Okay. So as you can see, we have been uh, probably absent for the last three years. Physically, that is, but we have always been with you okay, in spirit. Having had the opportunity as well to minister online, but if you would allow me to say just, wow, this is how it feels to be once again standing before you to proclaim the word. And wow again for this beautiful place that you have here, where many churches during the pandemic actually, well, lost the capacity to sustain ministry but not is BCF. I hope you see that as God being very, very faithful to you and that you would actually pay it back by way of, you know, your, your life surrendered to Him. Also, wow, because yesterday when we arrived here, the place was a beehive of activity. And all young people, I understand, from three churches and one missions organization. There are some familiar faces that we see, but for the most part, many are new to us. So, we thank our SBCF family for having us once again, physically, after three years. And I praise the Lord that once again, I will have this opportunity to proclaim and declare His word to all of us, to all of you. And I pray that His word does not come back to Him empty, empty. Now, the there's a, lot, a wide cross-section now of people attending SBCF. Yesterday, a whole lot of, uh, you know, young people, the youth, and even today, the middle-aged, the married couples, well, the kind of older ones, but I don't think anyone here is older than myself, okay? So, I thought that, no, I think that's the wrong word to say, I thought. It is by the leading of the Spirit that I was led actually to focused on how we are able to minister one with the other, considering the wide cross-section of uh, members in the church. And so this morning, I would like for us to focus and learn from what the Apostle Paul advised, counseled, and equipped his two young pastors, his spiritual sons, Timothy and Titus, as we focus on Two significant verses from both books. First Timothy 5, 1 to 16. If you have your Bible, open it there and put your finger because we'll be visiting with that uh, passage because all the verses are embedded in the message. And then also Titus 2, 1 to 8. Okay? That's Titus 2, 1 to 8. All right? So, beloved, are we ready to hear the word of God? Let's open in a word of prayer, shall we? Oh, Lord, Heavenly Father, how we praise you and how we thank you for this wonderful time together. Thank you. Thank you, oh, Lord, for once again allowing myself and my wife to be able to physically minister here in this BCF, a church, a family that has honored us all these years as part, as one of them, one with them. And Lord, with this time, together, may your Holy Spirit Guide my lips, guide my mind and my heart as I proclaim your word. And may it not come back to you empty. Bless all the people who would hear your word and allow for them to just trust and obey going forward. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Now, ministering to men, women, even children of all ages, also civil and spiritual status, follows the dictum. Different strokes for different folks. 
different strokes for different folks. And yet, it doesn't depart from the primary ministry task of the church, which is talking and walking. Godliness to all people. Talking and walking, that is to say, teaching and modeling. Godliness to all people. Titus 2.1 actually headlines that, uh, that command to us. Teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Now, this emphasis on sound doctrine points to the fullness of the Christian doctrine and focuses on the content of our faith. Believers in all age groups in the church, in this particular situation, SBCF, must thoroughly, and I say it again, thoroughly equip. Equip being prepared. Prepared, okay? In the word and in prayer so that they will not be swayed by the deceitful promises of false teachers. And that abounds out there. All you have to do is just open television, okay? And social media, and you will see there the many deceitful promises of false teachers. The world actually in general. The possible devastation of tragic circumstances. The pandemic actually has caused so much pain, so much despair in many people. Okay? In our prayer for uh, earlier, okay? uh, for the giving, our sister talked about anxiety and all. So, these d- devastating tragic circumstances could sway us either way. Either we gravitate closer to the foot of the cross and surrender our lives, crying out to the Lord for help. Or we could walk away shaking our head, even blaming God, asking Him, how could a good God like yourself allow bad things to happen to good people like ourselves? And then there is the pool of mindless and careless emotionalism. This morning, we will study Paul's instruction to his spiritual sons, young pastors, Timothy and Titus, concerning ministry to different age groups in the church. We will make it everybody's responsibility, and I say everybody's responsibility, for it is not the responsibility of Pastor Mao and Pastor JB and anybody else who stands behind your pulpit, a pastor proclaiming the word, you know, to do all of these things. For after all, did you not hear in Ephesians that you have been gifted with gifted men, pastors and all, so that you might be equipped, equipped being preparing you. And what are the tools used by pastors, these gifted men, to teach you? They use actually primarily the word of God. The Word of God. And that's why Titus says, okay, teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. The second tool is prayer. For apart from prayer, there is no power in what we do. Apart from the guidance and the leading of the Spirit in us. And then there is, hear this. All these supposed, supposed tragic circumstances in our lives, the testing of our faith, is also a tool used by these gifted men, the Holy Spirit even, to prepare us, to equip us, to teach us, to surrender all to Him who is able. After all, the songs said to us, Christ is life, Christ is peace. And so, we will study false instruction to His sons. This is not a one-month task. This is everybody's duty. This is everybody's responsibility to make Christ known. But even before we are able to make Him known, we must know Him intimately. Let us therefore pick up nuggets of wisdom relevant to the discipleship relationship, so-called discipleship relationship. That is how we build each other up in, in, uh, in sound doctrine. And when I talk discipleship relationship, I'm talking both ways. Interdiscipleship inter- relationship and intra-generational. When I talk inter, it is within your peer, peer group. Yeah. No, no. When I talk intra, it's about you within your peer group. Okay? When I talk intra, it is from an older generation to the young, 
the more mature to the less mature as applicable to different age groups here in our church, SBCF. And so, without further delay, let us talk about what, what, what was instructed to Timothy and Titus concerning men. Are there any men in the house today? Any men around here? This is about you. In 1 Timothy 5.1a, it says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your, your, your father. In Titus 2.2, 2, Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Now, the verb rebuke here is very strong. It is one that implies censure, calling out, putting in the right place. And still, an older sinning member is to be shown respect, notwithstanding, as if he were your father, by not being addressed with harsh words. Now, an older man here, in this context, indicates older men in general, not the office of elder. The younger Timothy was to confront sinning older men with deference and honor which is clearly inferred from Old Testament principles. In Leviticus 19.32, it says, Rise in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly. Okay? In John 32.6, 32, uh, it says, I am young. You are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. He was to exhort them or come alongside them to strengthen them, to strengthen them. For after all, all of us, no exception, we pass through that path, so to speak, of weakness, okay? of meaninglessness, even in our lives. And that is where we, we fail, we falter, we fall. That's the nature of man. We're faint. And that's why we need each other. In this particular case, we're talking about older men, older men. So how is Pastor Mao, Pastor JB, to minister to older men when they are still in their 30s? How is he, Pastor Mao, able to, you know, to exhort me being twice his age, even though I am in that position of weakness? Well, he is to come alongside me, to strengthen me, to honor me even, and treat me with deference. On the other hand, older men like myself must testify with our lives that is consistent with Christian doctrine. And that's why it's key for you, beloved, the young, the young ones among you, to start young. To start young. Remember the Lord in your youth so that when, you know, the crisis of old age is upon you, you will not look at life as meaningless. You start young. You start now. Because there's no turning back in life. You progress. That is, okay? If you are to, to observe the limit of our years, 70, but 80 when you're strong. And that is why we pray, my wife and myself, we are already in the first critical decade of our life. We are in the 70s. So we're hoping that, you know, the Lord keeps us healthy. And praise be to his name that these last three years, the pandemic notwithstanding, we remain firmly anchored okay, on the rock of our salvation, able to minister. Okay. If we were actually hampered in traveling, we were able to do so by way of, well, Zoom, online ministry. So there's no interruption there whatsoever except for the physical. Okay. So start young, I say. And when you have older folks, older men who are perhaps, you know, uh, missing the mark, you are to stand alongside them, to encourage them. But use words that are not harsh, but words that are gentle, that, that, that are honorable, just the same. This is everybody's responsibility, not just your pastors. To this, Paul emphasizes the need for being of sound, being sound in faith. In love and endurance, and I'm talking about older men. Faith, which is built up actually over time, over years, 
You have the blessing of time, beloved the older men. Time that allows for you to experience the goodness, the faithfulness, the forgiveness of God in your life. And therefore, that should have built you up. Built you up spiritually. And built you up as well in love. For after all, anything and everything that is done, firstly and foremost in love, produces the kind of results that you could only hear. Well, acquire when the Holy Spirit is in you. And it gives you endurance, no matter the difficulties of life today. When your faith is so built in love, you could endure. You could endure. And then we treat to the younger men. Treat younger men as brothers. First Timothy 5.1b says this, Treat younger men as brothers. And then Titus 2, 6 to 8, similarly encourage the young men to be self-controlled and everything set them, at its, set them an example by doing what is good. And your teaching show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now, when dealing with younger men, younger men, after urging self-control, what does self-control mean here, by the way? Self-control is actually all about having a changed mind, a converted heart. Mind and heart that work together in obedience to the Word of God. That's a converted mind and a changed heart, self-control. And everything, <clears throat> a virtue which many young men are deficient. No offense intended there, but it's only speaking the truth. A virtue in which young men are deficient. Self-control, that is. Paul places heavy emphasis, therefore, on the example of Timothy and Titus. They themselves being young men, ministering to fellow young men, but also to older men. As young pastors, great responsibility rests on them to show to show personal integrity. What is integrity? That is doing the right thing even though no one is watching. But that's actually not entirely true. No man may not be, may, may be not watching, or maybe watching, but the Lord God is watching. He never misses anything. He's the God who never slumbers. He sees, he knows, he hears. He feels. But he cares just the same. So we cannot mock God, not in this way anyway. As young pastors, great responsibility rests on them to show integrity and seriousness, especially in the manner of speech. In 1 Timothy 4.12b, it says, set an example. Set an example. Walk your talk. Do not open your mouth until after you have opened your Bible. Do not go about throwing around passages and verses that you yourself do not understand, that you have not lived out, that you have not taken in. Be careful. Be an example. Men will have to give an account of every careless word they have spoken. That is Matthew 12, 36. We will give an account. We will give an account so that others may not have a cause to speak ill of Christians. Let's not give them a reason to embarrass us, embarrass our family, our faith, our God. They would not cease, these attackers, but they will embarrass themselves by having to make up their own baseless false accusations. Let's not help them. Let them, but let's not help them by being a good example of integrity and seriousness in our lives. How about women? Any women in the house here? Concerning women, treat older women as mothers. First Timothy 5.2a, it says, Older women, treat older women as mothers. Titus 3 to 4a, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women. In giving advice about older women, Paul concentrates on the need for a serious attitude of mind. 
What is he talking about? Take a look at your passage. To be reverent in the way they live. To be reverent. What is the word reverent? Well, some would say it's actually the kind of fear, not, that you would, not so that you would be punished by a holy God, but reverence means, you know, being ashamed, being embarrassed, being fearful that you would displease your God who has done everything for you and continues to be faithful to you. So you treat him with reverence. That's honor. That's actually, you know, doing things that will not displease him. To please him and to honor him and to bless his name. Okay. That being the case, there is the provision, prohibition I should say, for slander. If you are to demonstrate reverent lives, you are not to be a slanderer. And you are not to engage in excess, excessive wine, which reflects the contemporary situation in Crete where Titus ministered at the time. That Paul used addicted to wine suggests a bondage that was more acute among women in Crete than in Ephesus. What is the problem with being addicted to wine? Well, when you are addicted to wine, you are under the Spirit, but not the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the battle. The spirit of alcohol. And when you are under such, you are not in control of things, you know, that you say. Things that you do. You could easily uh, slip in the tongue, okay? And whatever else in your actuation that will embarrass you and embarrass your God. You will not serve a good example to others. And that will give reason to the world to say, derogatory things about Christians, about the Christian faith, and about Christ himself. Is that how Christians are? They would ask. Rather, on a positive note, older women are to be good teachers. Teachers as it pertains to the home, the domestic front, which moves us to treating younger women as sisters. 1 Timothy 5.2b, it says, Treat younger women as sisters with absolute purity. And then Titus 2.4b to, to 5, To love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one, here it comes again, will malign the word of God. In treating younger women as sisters, Paul adds a caution, which is what? With absolute purity. Absolute purity. It's not just plain and simple purity as it, as, uh, as it is, no? But there's the added emphasis, absolute purity. Leaving no room whatsoever. Okay? Leaving no room whatsoever to any impurity in one's life. This suggests that purity in relationship with them is Highly and very essential. Paul also sees it, as, sees it as the task of older women. The task of older women to instruct the younger women. The relationship with the, first, uh, the earlier passage is older women must live with reverence. Okay? Moving about or uh, moving away from slander and excessive wine, but rather. Focus as good teachers in the domestic front. And this is how they do it. This is how they do it. Okay? The instruction centers on love to husband and children. That is what older women ought to be ministering to and you know, teaching, demonstrating to younger women. This cannot be taken for granted, especially today in our time when marital discord resulting in breakup and separation is rising, ever rising, when the care of children comes first before husband. And for that matter, okay, second to careers. It's not unusual okay, to hear certain couples, okay, okay, as part of their complaint one to the other, that when they were just husband and wife, okay, wife is so sweet to the husband. 
Every time he comes home, she will be there waiting with his slippers ready, a warm towel, and the food on the table. Okay? Warm. But when the firstborn came, okay, he will come to a dark, you know, to a dark house because the wife is in the room caring for the young ones. And then he will ask, where is my dinner? It's on the table. Just hit it. And when you ask why, they would say, okay, my husband is an adult. He can take care of himself. But my baby is only, what, two months old. He cannot take care of himself. So I need to take care of him. And they're missing the point right there. Missing the point right there. If there might be something like that happening right here, please go to Ephesians 5. So that you may have the full instruction of what Paul means when he says that wives should take care primarily of their husband. Even before the children come. So that cannot be taken for granted. The qualities required of younger women are those needed in the domestic front. Where self-control, there you go again. Self-control meaning what? A converted mind and a changed heart according to sound doctrine. Purity, it means the same thing. If you are to be pure, you must ascribe, you must abide in the word of the Lord, what he means by being pure. Kindness as well. They are of great value in a Christian home. Paul assumes that the Christian wife should be submissive to her own husband, Ephesians 5. The subject is dominated by a spiritual motive. It's about what the Lord teaches, what the Lord commands. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. Okay? That a wife should submit to her own husband. And this submission doesn't mean superiority on the part of the husband, inferiority on the part of the wife. It is just the way it is, as the Lord commands. In any organization, the government, the military, okay, there's always somebody who is the head. Not everybody in the army could be all generals. Not everybody in Malacanang could be all presidents. Not everybody actually at home could be the husband and leader. One has got to do that duty, but it carries a heavy responsibility concerning women. Now let's talk to widows. Let's talk about widows, I should say. Older widows. Alone and in need are to be honored. First Timothy 5, 3, 5, 9 to 10 as well says this. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and developing herself to all kinds of good deeds. Now, Paul is concerned first with widows with no means of support. And I am sure, okay, given the situation nowadays, okay, we may have one or two of those okay, in our church family here, and it's BCF. Paul is concerned with widows with no means of support, primarily financial. Now, at a time when there was no welfare state, during the time of Paul, wala po silang DSWD at the time. All right? Walang ayuda. So he's saying here, okay, the alleviation of poverty was a real problem, and Paul recognized that the Christian had a responsibility on this, the Christian church. But financial support from the church is mandatory only for widows who have no means to provide for their daily needs. That's the condition right there. The words left alone denote presumably a permanent condition of being forsaken and left without resources. The widow is really a widow in this particular case with no support. He, she is the real widow here since there is no family to support her. 
In such a state, she puts her hope in God and God alone, which pertains to a settled attitude of hope in God alone. In New Testament culture, 60 was considered retirement age. By that age, older women would have completed their child rearing and would have the time, maturity, and character to devote their lives in service to God and the church as well. They also would not be likely to remarry and become preoccupied with that commitment, although there might be some exceptions here. The phrase be put on the first on the list pertains to those eligible especially for especially recognized ministry and not necessarily church support. Now, to this end, the widow's past experience and good reputation are of practical importance. What are we talking about here? This could very well be the clear guidelines, clear-cut guidelines that would allow churches like ourselves here in SBCF to be able to minister in effect, minister effectively to our identified widows. So the first identified widow who is called the real widow is the older widow, over 60 years old, alone and in need, and therefore they need to be honored. Here's another kind of widow. Older widows with living children. They should be cared for by their own families. 1 Timothy 5, 4, 8, and 16. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, this should learn, first of all, okay, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family. So repaying their parents and grandparents. For this is pleasing to God. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. Are we listening, people? Are we listening to the word of the Lord? Paul expressed in no uncertain terms that families, not the church, have the primary responsibility for their own widows. Children and grandchildren are indebted to those who brought them into the world, reared and loved them. Fulfilling this responsibility is a mark of godly obedience. In Exodus 20 verse 12, it says, Honor your mother, honor your father. Failure of Christians to provide for their own is seen to have disastrous consequences, which is what? A denial of the faith and the principle of compassionate Christian love. In John 13.35, it heralds, All men, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And it begins with your own household, your closest neighbors. And hope does not disappoint because God has poured out his love into our hearts. Romans 5.5. 5. We have what it takes. If only we will take heed. If only we would embrace and abide. We know how it should be done. If only we would listen. Which is an example worse than okay, being unbelievers. If you do not take care of your own widows in your own family. In, all of, in no stronger terms could Paul have expressed the importance of social and filial responsibilities within Christian families. But is this happening? Yes, it is. Believe me, beloved, in my years as a counselor, and now my focus is not only marriage and family. I'm also into the senior's ministry, being a senior citizen my, myself. We know the crisis, we know the pains, the aches, the frustrations, things that we are no longer able to do and think about. We sleep here and there. We know the crisis, so we understand each other. We understand as well when our own turns their back on us, particularly at such a time when we truly need them. These are the people, family, Members are called worse than unbelievers when they do not take care 
of their own, particularly the widows. Widows who are carnal and live only for pleasure are to be are to receive no help. There's, this is the ter- third kind of windows. Widows, I should say. Widows who are carnal and live only for pleasure are to receive no help. 1 Timothy 5, 6 to 7, it says, But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. Paul here was aware that there were widows who lived for worldly pleasure. He did not expect the church to provide for such a lifestyle, particularly if any element of immorality is implied by the word. Dead even while she lives, says the passage. Dead even while she lives points to a widow who lives a worldly, immoral, and godly life. That though she might be physically alive, her lifestyle proves she is unregenerate, unchanged, no self-control, unconverted, and is therefore spiritually dead, separated from the Father. Timothy is to give clear instructions in such matters to help such women to avoid blame. In this essentially practical issue, Paul is not only concerned for the individual, but also for the impact of a bad testimony on the believers. Remember, this is about walking and talking. This is about teaching and demonstrating. You cannot just say with words and do something else with your life. Okay. Hindi po ito, sabi, gawin nyo ang sinasabi ko at huwag nyo gawin ang ginagawa ko. That's not actually the literal translation in Filipino. This is actually being a person of integrity. What you say, you do yourself. That is us being living testament of the power of the word. And then there is the fourth, widow. The younger widows are to be allowed to remarry. The younger widows are to be allowed to remarry. 1 Timothy 5, 11 to 15. As for young widows, do not put them on such a list, the list of widows. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus, they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to remarry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. Now, young widows presented a different concern because of the possibility of remarriage, which is actually in many ways encouraged here. This excluded them from the list mentioned in verse 9, the list of widows, 60 and above in age. There is no suggestion here that any young widow who is poverty-stricken would not qualify for some help from the church. They could. They could. Poverty-stricken. Paul seems to be thinking of widows who volunteer for Christian work, but would be placed in difficult situation if they wanted to remarry at some point. If they forsook their commitment to Christian work in order to remarry, they would incur judgment. But how come? How come, you would probably ask? When a man takes a vow to the Lord or an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must, and she must, not break his word, okay? But must do everything he said. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. You promise, you deliver. If you make a vow to the Lord, do not be slow to pay. Deuteronomy 23, 21. You make a promise, do it, and do it quick. There's also the twin dangers of idleness and gossiping. Ano pong tawag natin dito? Mga marites ngayon, di ba? Marami rin ganyan niyo, walang magawa. So, that seem to be connected to their being busy bodies or literally one who moves around. One who moves around. In other words, they could not be trusted with confidence. 
they could not be trusted with confidence. If there's anything faster than fax, okay, try, no, email I should say, not fax, email. If there's anything faster than email, try female, Brother Philip. No offense intended, sisters. Just an illustration of something that is prevalent even these days, okay? In other words, they could not be trusted with confidences. The positive advice to young widows to remarry and devote themselves to domestic responsibilities may seem to contradict Paul's preference for the unmarried state. He says in 1 Corinthians 7, 8 to 9, Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried. But it, it should also be remembered that these widows would have been grouped among those who could not control themselves. So there's the distinction right there. Too much time with not enough thing to do is dangerous for anyone except perhaps those too old to get into trouble. An idle mind is actually a playground for the enemy. Again, Paul's major concern is to avoid reproach on the church. Hence, Paul's counsel was that younger widows should not take the vow and be added to the list. Instead, they should marry, raise a family, manage their homes, and thus being occupied, give the enemy no opportunity for slander. The reference to Satan points to the results of the young widows acting unwisely, for the enemy is ever ready to seize opportunities to slander God's work. He's a prowling lion waiting for people, those who are unmindful, to devour. Watch out. Paul wanted to be certain that the instructions of verse 8 were understood to include self-situated women and men. It applies to both women and men. The men would be the obvious objects of Paul's directions, but not necessarily the women. So as a closing note, Paul specified that any, and I say any believing woman who possessed the means bore the same responsibilities for widows in her family as would a man in similar circumstances. That is to say, if you're a woman who can afford to support a widow in your own family, then help. If you are a man with, uh, with resources, you are able to help a widow in your family. Do so as well. There is no distinction there. The only commonality is you are both able, and therefore you are urged to be willing. This relieved the congregation of the responsibility so that the church could help those widows really in need. How do we weave all of these things together in our final thoughts? Having people of all ages in the church makes the body strong. Makes the body strong. And that's what I see here in SBCF with the all-inclusive okay, congregation that we have here. Men, women, young, old, we have children as well. If we are able to make our mind in the same place, our focus on the same Lord, and we are equipped actually with, in good doctrine, it will make this body even stronger. And I think that is what actually cost you and made you survive the pandemic. Where many churches okay, had members falling away and the church left on its own to fend without resources. And many closed actually, particularly those in, in malls. And now that the doors are open, they're fighting it hard as well to win back the very same people who attended with them. But not as BCF. Not as BCF in many ways. And yet you are not without actually your own trials, your own testing of faith. That you remain faithful, the Lord has remained faithful. Or should I say the opposite? That God has remained faithful to you, so you have remained faithful to Him. And so, what do you do? Continue to build yourselves up in your most holy faith and build each other up as well. Build yourselves up. Get to know Christ more. 
and build other people up so that you could make Christ known widely as well. That is what's being said here to us. Together with the servant leaders, P. Mao and P. J. B., the older and more mature members, and there are those among you here as well, through intergenerational, okay? Discipleship relationship, the older ministering to the young, should help teach the younger and less mature ones by good words, good words, good deeds, reinforced by the testimony of their lives. You walk, you talk, and you talk, you walk. This call holds true for the more mature young ones, the young adults among you, okay? among less mature young adults, through intergener intergenerational, among yourselves, among your peers, okay? discipleship relationship. I'm glad to hear from uh, Bishop Noel, okay? the long-term vision of PCEC to develop stronger churches by way of discipleship. That is how we keep the body strong. Not just this is BCF body, but the general body, the overall body of, of Christ. Together, we could do this. This call holds true for the more mature young ones among the less mature young ones through intergenerational discipleship. This is how all age groups, chronological and spiritual, in the church are strengthened in the faith and Christian values are passed on from generation to generation so that no one may cast doubt upon our Christian faith and witness more so upon our Lord and Savior. Let us not give the enemy the opportunity to penetrate even an inch of our mind and heart, saturate ourselves in the word. Leave no space for him. No space. As for financial support, the church has always had limited resources. It's a common thing among churches. And has always had to balance financial responsibility with fiscal generosity. What's the difference between financial responsibility and fiscal generosity? Financial is when you have the resources to cover all your responsibility. Fiscal generosity is how to wisely use that which the Lord has provided for you. You have plans, you have budget, okay? you have actually things that cover the necessities of the church according to priority. It makes sense, therefore, for all members, all members to work diligently and to be independent if they can so that they can support themselves and help others as well in need. When church members are both responsible and generous, everyone's needs will be met. Take a look at Acts 2, 44 and 45. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They gave to anyone as he had need. So I say to you, beloved, there is no Lone Ranger Christian. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to sulk in one corner crying out to yourself that no one is helping you. This is a family. We are a family. We are here to hold hands, to affirm each other, to stand alongside each other, to strengthen each other. We are here for each other. Build up yourselves and each other and together build up the entire body. The condition, all in accord with sound doctrine. Let me illustrate that by way of something more practical. Illustration number one. This is the discipleship network inside the church. Each and every Christian, every one of you, should have a Paul-like discipler, a Paul-like mentor, somebody more mature, somebody more uh, deeper in the world who could teach you, who could mentor you, a Paul. But you must also have your own Barnabas and your own Silas to walk with you. Your, what's this? Your prayer circle, your prayer bodies. This is your accountability partnership, your Barnabas and your Silas. And then you must also have under you a Timothy and a Titus to whom you are able to pass everything 
that you have learned from your Paul. So at some point of your Christian walk, okay, your Barnabas and your Silas and yourself would also be what? Paul to your Timothy and Titus. And Timothy and Titus would have their own Barnabas and Silas. They would become Paul also as we all continue to grow in the world. This is how we build each other up. Build each other up and the body in accord with sound doctrine. How about outside there? This is a big mall out there. I was glad to know yesterday when I was told that you are reaching out also to the employees of the mall, beginning with the guards, opening space for them. I hope that you are also able to reach out to them by way of the word. This is an alliteration that I, I hope would, you know, would inspire you. You're familiar with the word prism. Prism. We are taught in science, okay, that the prism could actually absorb and reflect sunlight, okay? Let's talk, let's talk and, uh, and refer to the triune God by way of what we see here. The sun could very well be God the Father. The ray could very well be Jesus the Son. And the warmth that we feel okay, could very well be the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by this? What's my point? The point is, when you allow yourself to be the prism, okay, the sun, the ray, and the worm passing through you, through other people, you are able to help other people see what they might be missing in their life. But what does prism mean? When we spell prism, P-R-I-S-M, P could very well be prayer. B Constantly in prayer for names and faces that the Lord could bring to your subconscious mind, to your heart as well. Even as you search for somebody to minister to. Pray continually for faces, for names, for the Lord to give you. And once you have the name and the face, relate to them. Relate to them. Evangelism these days is no longer as hard for as it used to be. When we would say, when you die today, where would you go? Do you know? And we hit actually this not believer yet with the Bible in the head. We no longer do it that way. Discipleship today, no, uh, evangelism today is relational. It's about friendship. It's, it opens the door. It makes things easier for the person to receive what you're saying. So, pray, then relate. And as you relate, invite them as well. This is a mall, okay? Little copy here, a little copy there, okay? Or perhaps a little, uh, you know, street food, okay? Along the parking, okay? Invite them for something that gives you the opportunity to, to talk and relate. And given the opportunity, S, share the word. Share about your experience. Share about the love of God. Share about His compassion. Share everything that there is to share that you have experienced. Do not talk about anything that you do not know anything about. Do not speak on top of your head. Okay? Do not share passages that you have not taken in and lived out and therefore not in a position to pass on. Talk about your experiences with God. His love, His peace, His compassion, which are new every morning. That's why you could cry, cry out, Great indeed, O Lord, is your faithfulness. And when you share, and the Lord willing, if this person is a chosen one, they would receive and accept. Do not leave them hanging. What do you do? M. What do you think M means? Mentor. What's another word for mentor? Disciple them. Okay? Plug them in into a small group. They could very well be your Titus and your, uh, and, your, uh, and your Timothy. Continue to lead them. Continue to guide them. Continue to teach them. Continue to demonstrate to them what doctrine, the good doctrine is all about. And when we do this inside the church, the Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, Titus Discipleship Network, 
and we do prism outside, what do you think would be the result of this in God's own perfect time? There should be no vacant chairs here occupied today by angels, but all warm bodies. And perhaps people lining up there, standing room only. But that's for the Lord to bless you with. But you start with the work, with discipleship relationship that help, that help you grow in the knowledge of the Lord and help you actually go out there to make him known. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, much has been said, and yet there's still much more to be said. Allow us, O oh Lord, allow us to trust and to obey, beginning with our own selves. Allow us to do an inventory of ourselves every single day so that we may know where we stand. Are we standing on solid ground, founded on solid and sound doctrine? as we have been encouraged and taught today by Paul. Help us and lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit so that we may be encouraged and we may be empowered. Help us, O Lord, to develop this discipleship network inside our own family. But not forgetting the outside world as well as we look out. Cause us to reach out using prayer, relationship, invitation, and sharing to also mentor other people who have yet to hear the gospel, who have yet to know the love, the forgiveness, and the grace of the Lord. Continue to build this body, O Lord, SBCF, for we surrender all to you. Even as you call on each and every one of us, to convict us that truly, truly, there are no Lone Ranger Christians that we are a family. And as a family, we could, holding hands, connecting our minds and our hearts, surrender all to you to help build each other in our most holy faith that we might become who you would like for us to be. People who present a strong and powerful Christian witness to the world. And the world would know that truly we belong with you by the manner and the, that we love and live our lives. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Oh
Let's give the Lord one last clap offering to end this wonderful worship service. Thank you, Pastor Arnold, for sharing us the Lord's instructions on how we can minister to one another here at church. Okay, uh, we'll make this quick before our worship service ends. Just two announcements I'd like to make, just two. Uh, we had a very successful youth wired group gathering yesterday. Uh, we don't have pictures, but... Uh, we'll be posting it sometime soon, but it looked like in the pictures there were over 80 plus kids that were here, youth. And uh, they are the future of, uh, of the leadership of our countries and their respective communities. So praise God for the opportunity to minister to them and for them to form great relationships with one another. That being said, we have another Youth Wired event, uh, which is a graduation special on July 1, 3 to 5 p.m. here at the Worship Center. Our dear brother Simon and sister Jane Mercada will be the one leading that. So if you are a youth and you'd like to attend that or know people who would like to attend, we encourage you to invite them uh, to join that event. Sign-up sheets are at the ushering booth. So uh, let's continue to share the word and hopefully we can continue to minister to more and more youths around our community. Offering boxes are located at the end of this worship hall and at the entrance uh, of our church. So please don't forget to drop your offerings uh, in the boxes. Do not leave them in front uh, of the seat because no one will pick that up. <laughs> okay, and if you prefer to do a bank transfer, our account is there. You can just deposit that uh, through bank transfer at your convenience. 
Okay, our worship service would not be complete until we welcome those who are worshiping with us for the first time. So if this is your first time worshiping with us, kindly raise your hand so we could recognize you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sisters, for joining us today. We hope you had a wonderful worship experience with us. Thank you as well, ma'am, for joining us, sister. Are there anybody else here uh, worshiping with us for the first time? Nobody? Everybody else's family? If you haven't done so already, please fill out a Connect card on your way out and just give it to one of the ushers or drop it in the offering box so we could reach out to you. And if you have any questions, you can contact us and we can get back to you regarding that. Amen? Okay, uh, Pastor Arnold, would you care to close us in a word of prayer? So continue to disciple each other. You have all the forum, the groups actually, the wild, uh, the youth, the, the young adults, the women, the men, and perhaps your own individual growth groups as well at home. Continue to build each other up in your most holy faith. Let's all stand up, please, as we close in a word of prayer and benediction. As this is my first time again in three years to come. Know that we have not stopped praying for you, even in that we, are not, we were not here physically. Because this is also our church, and we love all of you. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derive its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And His church says, Amen and Amen. Go with God.